Hello and welcome again to Mid American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shade Spain. This week we've got a lot of questions to answer. We've got some really great show and tells that our expert panelists have brought in. So let's jump right in, shall we? Let's have them introduce themselves and we'll start down here with you, Marty. Thank you, Tanisha. Um, my name is Marty Alanya and I'm a landscaper. I, my fondness is for perennials and shrubs and trees. I'm not crazy about annuals, but you got a couple guys here who know all about this, so you don't need me. We've got all the bases covered, That's right. right? All right, next, John. I'm John Bowden Center. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener, and uh, I kind of like it. I like annuals, perennials, hostas, trees, shrubs. If it grows in the ground, I kind of like it. If it photosynthesizes. <laughs> That's his wheelhouse. Yeah. And you say you like hostas. <laughs> I think it's a little bit more than a like yeah. for hostas, but we'll get into that a little bit later. And last but not least. Yeah. My name is Dyke Barkley. I teach the horticulture program down at Lakeland College in Mattoon. Uh, really, I guess my specialty would be perennials and grasses, but I, I'm a plant geek. I like everything unusual. Wonderful. So we, like I said, we've got some great panelists today and we'll be answering a lot of your questions. So Marty, we're going to start down with you. We've got some show and tells. We've got lots of show and tells to get to. Yes, we do. I brought some um, late summer, early fall blooming plants and even fall. And there were more I could bring, but you know, it's only half an hour show. <laughs> so, but these are some of my favorites. This is, um, this is actually a Rudbeckia like uh, Black Eyed Susan, except it's Rudbeckia herta. This is called Cherry Brandy. Mm. And it calls it a black-eyed Susan, but these flowers are just mm -hmm. so pretty. And once it's out of the pot and it grows larger, which it will when it's out of the pot, the flowers are more like that big, more like three inches across. They've got that fabulous autumn shade with kind of a chocolate milk eye and then the, the very colored in the center. They're just fabulous. That they is get a about, really great color. Yeah, Perfect and they're for so fall. nice. Perfect. Yeah. They're not as hardy. Rebecca herta comes that you're more, probably more familiar seeing them with a large yellow flower. But they're not as hardy, but they do reseed themselves pretty readily if you can get them to survive. It's kind of windy where I live. I keep trying. I love them. I love them. Um, next up, these will bloom starting like late summer, and they'll just bloom through fall. Uh, even midsummer. Just depends. This is one of my favorite. This is my favorite geranium, really. I've got some other ones that I love. But this is Roseanne geranium. The, the variety is Roseanne. Roseanne blooms beautifully all season long. Um, she's about, well, this is almost, almost the size she is, a little, little bit taller maybe. Um, I still have yet to plant these in the ground, but you get, you get a flushes of these beautiful lavender flowers all summer into fall until frost. They're just, they're just lovely in a little partially shaded place. The, the cherry brandy rudbeckia, they like full sun. They have a fuzzy leaf, typically something with a fuzzy leaf likes a, a hot full sun exposure. That's a good note. The hair on the leaf shades the leaf a little bit so they can stand a lot more sun. Um, you can see these are very smooth. They like a, actually they are a little bit fuzzy, but they like a, a partial sun shade situation so they need their feet cool these don't mind if the ground is hot they don't mind they like heat uh, let me see here's a here's a popular fall bloomer with gardeners a lot of a lot of uh, lay people aren't familiar with them but this is tricertus it's a, a toad lily is the common name because if you can see the flowers they are speckly like a toad i don't know if you can catch that or not with the camera but these are about to bloom they're just lovely. This variety is called Samurai, and I especially like it because it has variegation on the leaves, mm -hmm. on the sword-shaped leaves. You see what I did there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> samurai. Okay, so these are, these are very fine and delicate, but if you have a place where you step out the door and it's shady and cool with just a little bit of filtered sun, these will do beautifully. And they'll do, the variegation makes it pretty all summer, and then in late summer, early fall, here come these beautiful flowers, and they come in other, other shades too. And this is not in bloom right now, but this is Simicifuga. It's uh, bugbane is the common name. It will get, say this is your <coughs> yard, it, the foliage will get about this tall, and then it sends up long wands with a white bottle brush flower on that are beautifully scented. These come in green, but this particular variety is brunette, no, 
I think this one might be black negligee. It's one of those two. I can't remember which one it is. I got it cheap because the label fell off. <laughs> 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 they have a, a purpley cast to their foliage. And when it's, this is, you know, just purchased where it was at the garden center. But when it gets in the ground, the foliage would be much more purple than this. So it has the added attraction of colored foliage, not just green, and these lovely wand-like flowers. And the last one is, oh, we got a bonus of a little spider web there. <laughs> this is a blooming allium. It's, a, it's an ornamental allium. Allium are onions. Mm -hmm. Every onion you've ever seen is in the allium family. And every onion you plant in your garden will bloom. And oddly, the flowers are very sweetly scented. And pollinators love these things. Actually, pollinators love all these guys. Um, but these are very hardy. <laughs> Uh, they look a little better than this when they get in the ground. This one's been waiting and waiting and waiting Very for Marty waiting. to plant it. <laughs> yeah, but these, these flower heads are just beautiful. You can see a little bit of the lavender. This one's starting to fade, but these are beautiful umbels of this lovely lavender shade. Strong, wandy stems, and then when they dry, you can leave them. They almost look like giant dandelion heads, and they mm -hmm. catch the snow, and they're just, they're just very, very pretty, and they're dead hardy. I mean, completely hardy. Full sun. They tolerate everything. So, so this is for folks who, because I know you like a pop of color. I do. Yes. So <laughs> you can get your foliage, you can get your green in there, but yeah. every once in a while you can enjoy a lovely spot of color. Yeah, these two guys really like sun. And then the other ones all like partial shade or part sun. Um, and the, the variegated foliage, absolutely. But... These, these particular ones I focused on the, on the flower because they're all kind of different and they're, they're very unusual, so. Wonderful, thank you so much. Sure. All right, John, on to you. I've got just a, something, uh, I, uh, an email. Uh, George and Lynette uh, were wondering uh, if they could transpl transplant their hostas now. This was in July, or do we need to wait until fall? And it depends on what you're going to do. If you're going to divide them, uh, rather than just transplanting, I would wait till spring. If you wait till spring, depending on how big they are, I wait until the leaves kind of open up so you can kind of see which ones are going to be uh, good and which ones are, 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 are where you can make your cuts. Because what you're going to do, uh, if, if they're very large, um, you may need a reciprocating. You dig them up, dig the whole plant up, and and lay it on its side and you may need because some of them are just tough uh, i had some this spring that i got 200 plants out of one plant <laughs> wow. and it <laughs> was sink. it was a big plant but uh, i i was able to to dig the whole ball up and i had to use my reciprocating saw and what i did is just go down made cuts and ended up with little squares like that and each one had at least two or three hostas in each one yet and uh, so <laughs> if they're not as quite as big, then you could take a serrated saw and, and do that. If you really want to get down to it, you can separate them by hand. And uh, depending on how long and how big these hostas are, um, if you want to just one, one sprout in each one, then, 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 then doing it by hand is, is um, uh, the best. If you're going to do it this fall, and I know it, we've had lots of rain this year off and on. If it's really dry, if you transplant it this fall, you'll want to make sure and get it into the ground as soon as you can. I would mulch it very good and water it. What I would do is water the hole uh, before you put the, dig the hole, before you put your hosta in, water it, let it sit for a few minutes, let the, the water drain and then water again. Do that a couple of times until uh, you're sure that the surrounding soil is moist because you don't want it to wick away from the hosta once you put it in there. Mm -hmm. Then fill it in and I would uh, mulch over the hosta and that's, that's if you're going to do it. And I usually don't divide in the fall. I usually, if I'm going to transplant the whole plant, I'll do that in the fall. Uh, if you have more questions on, on hostas, I just uh, did a podcast for mm -hmm. uh, Mid-American Gardener and that's go you can go on to, on to the website <laughs> mm -hmm. for Mid-American Gardener and find that um, but uh, just it, it, hostas are very very forgiving and there's so many <laughs> different varieties uh, there's 7400 that that is in this hostapedia book that I have and and I know there's a hundred <laughs> almost a year coming out or maybe more wow. so 
it's 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 it's, it's, it's such a forgiving and lovely plant. And so now, what does one do with two hundred plants? <laughs> um, <laughs> I have friends, I family. Christmas we, is coming. There you go. <laughs> I, I actually, we had a plant sale. The Master Gardeners had a plant sale, oh, and I, I gave some to the church plant sale. I gave them to just about all the plant sales. That Anybody we had. who wanted. And I still have. <laughs> I think I still have twenty in my yard to plant that I've still. They've been in the pot. Like I say, I did that early spring, and they're still in the pots because I haven't got to them. I haven't watered them. They just look lovely. I've had put them underneath <laughs> one of the trees. They're shaded and. They're they're just a growing like crazy, and I may have to divide them before I get them into the ground again. Oh, but wow. um, I have 300 varieties of hostas. I was my very that. question. And, my very um, question. There's probably <laughs> I probably have 10,000 plants. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. within those varieties. Wow. Of hosta. I have a lot of shade, so I don't get to grow. <laughs> I have one area of the yard you that's must. not shaded. But, <laughs> um, there's, um, I have a lot of hostas. So again, check out the podcast. It's, it's, um, it's, it, it oh, was, fun. it was fun to do. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, John. And Dyke, you brought a lot yeah. of stuff. So well, I just randomly grabbed some things that were in my yard, and I thought, you know, I, I, I you know, I love perennials and grasses. When I'm looking for something unusual, and so what I brought today was just talk about elephant ears. Mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of a neat tropical because they're a big leaf. Uh, the biggest thing with with elephant ears. Because you're not worrying about blooms and you're not worrying, it's easy to grow. Uh, mm -hmm. The hardest part is just trying to figure out what you're going to do in the winter, whether you're going to start over or you're going to bring them in. Uh, a couple of things about elephant ears, um, they've now become kind of popular. So there's actually four, depending on how you get it, four or five different genus that make up elephant ears. So uh, you can have elephant ears that are totally unrelated and they all look very similar. Um, and, and what size can they get? Um, I actually brought this, uh, this was just growing in a one gallon pot, so it's about 12 inches long. And then I've got this guy, which is growing in a bigger container, and that leaf, you know, with the stem oh. is, is six feet. And the individual plant that that's on has it's 20 to 30 really? leaves. Wow. But it's growing in a huge container, and I've overwintered it, so uh, the size of the container will determine. But you can get into all different patterns, so I just brought like the... Um, uh, one that has kind of a hint of black versus a, a shiny black. Mm -hmm. And then you can get into some that are just That's unbelievable. Live. Yeah, I, I really like the look of this. It's yeah. a lot harder one to raise. Uh, this yeah. one won't take full sun. Uh, uh, the green mm -hmm. one is out in full sun. So so you, you can't necessarily, because of the different types, you can't necessarily lump them all together. But they're easy to take care of. Um, and, and I would even recommend possibly leaving in a big container and setting the container in the ground. Uh, that, that, these great big ones of mine are in a container in a planter, so I can then dig them up and move the pot instead of having to dig the roots and chop them all back up. Wow. Indeed. So. That's dedication. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> now, Doug, so. do you cut those, the giant one? Do you cut those completely back and take them in? I cheat. Just? I have a greenhouse, so I ah. actually keep them as a live plant. Now, I can only do that, and I do have to thin them because they'll get, <laughs> yeah. just like tropical plants, they'll get too root bound. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of things I had to learn the very hard way, typical of me owning my own garden center, I would want to jump in in February and get things ready for spring and had very poor luck trying to repot and all that. And um, <clears throat> college intern needed something to do in the summer. We started propagating and all of a sudden they root fast, they grow fast. Yeah. You could, you, we ended up with more elephant ears, he, you know. So <laughs> I, the trick is Should if you're messing with them and going to divide and propagate them, it's not necessarily when you think it needs that 80, 85 degree weather and they root really easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were trying That's to root warm. them in January and get them, and they just weren't, they were just sitting there they looking at like us. They did like it. So, yeah. yes, no, I cheat. I keep them over and chop and machete them into pieces. Kind of like what John's talking about yeah, with hosta, hosta, but I yeah. do it with elephant ears in the greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, yeah. yeah. But they are beautiful though. Yeah. Now, is there something, you were talking about some of these are sun uh, tolerant and some aren't. How do you know if someone wanted to grow these? Ask. Okay. Ask. Okay. I don't think yeah. you can, I mean, you can kind of guess if you want to make a stereotype when you look at a leaf like this and, and you can't, I don't know if you can pick it up on TV, but you can already see how this is curling mm -hmm. for the, just the lights in here and the lack of water versus this upright, which is an oh, alocasia. Okay. Yeah. This one hangs down, which is a Kolakoski, and I'm just throwing big names out. But <laughs> um, so the thicker the leaf will also tell you it'll take more sun. Okay, yeah. But a lot of that's experience and a lot of it's moisture. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bitty container, they don't like to wilt. So if you put it in a small container and put it in sun, you're going to get burning. So some of that, if you can get it in a bigger container. 
So, I mean, like like the one I have in this is in a 14 inch oh, pot. Look at that. And it's oh, probably wow. got 40 to 50 leaves on it. Oh, that's beautiful. Man. So, it, it's really showy, and we've got it in a half sun location. Mm -hmm. So, gotcha. Okay. Oh, that okay. color is All right. fabulous. Thank you. All right, Marty, we're going to swing it back to you. Got a okay. question from Margie. She says, I have lots of potted foxglove plants that I'd like to place in a flower bed very soon, mm -hmm. which I'm thinking this may be an older question. Mm -hmm. How concerned should I be about planting them near herb or vegetables? Uh, it also, she also goes, we have no pets and small children who occasionally visit and never yet eaten our flowers. Um, to my knowledge, it's not a problem I think Margie is asking this question because foxglove is in the digitalis family and it's toxic. Mm -hmm. So as far as I know... It's, it's in the leaves. Not, yeah. It's not very much in the flower. It's yeah, the and, <coughs> and not in the... I, as far as I know, that would not affect your, your vegetable and edible no, plants. It's the, it's the foxglove plant itself, but its toxicity does not extend to the soil around it. So I don't think there'd be an issue. Good question, though. Yeah. She was doing her homework on Yeah, that. I mm -hmm. wouldn't even have mm -hmm. thought of that. Mm -hmm. I would have just thought, oh, that's right. Mm. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Here, have some lettuce. Yeah. I hate you. Okay. And you have to, you have to <laughs> really <laughs> take that and take a lot of it and, and yes. concentrate the digitalis out of it. I did some research in college on different plants and, you know, like um, um, different, different plants had hardly any digitalis. This one here has quite a bit. Really, um, and uh, interesting. Some things weren't weren't feasi economically feasible to pull the uh, digitalis. Yeah. This one was. So. Gotcha, huh. gotcha. Okay, all right, John. We're going to move to you. Oh. You've got a. Okay, I've got a mushroom. Okay. Um, what I this is a um, mayatake or hens of the wood, and um, I started out with little wood pieces like this that were inoculated with mushroom spores, and what you do is drill holes into. A certain type of wood, and depending on what you, there's research been done, what wood does best on, on uh, you know which type of mushroom goes best on wood. This grows best on oak. So what we did was harvested some oak, and you want to do it after two weeks after the you need a live tree, but you wait for two weeks because the tree has has um, antibodies or so to speak that won't allow mushrooms to grow. But after two weeks then it will allow it and you don't want it you need them fresh so that there's all the uh, nutrients for them for the mycelium to grow so drill holes cover them with that and this is called hen of the woods or mayatake mushrooms very very good now um you're always in the kitchen yes so how do you prepare <laughs> okay. these these uh, you, you what you would do is these are wonderful with a little bit of garlic uh, as an omelet um, just fried up. You can you can break them up. Put uh, you can just I know they probably are, they're scenting <laughs> the table up here. Um, but uh, you can bread them, emissions. deep fry them. Uh, just there's so a, a, any type of mushroom you can just kind of cook it the same way. But yeah. that's the way I like. I like a little bit of garlic with some eggs and make an omelet and mm, mm, mm. yum yum. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so Dyke, do you want to do? Another show and tell, or did you want to take a viewer question? Well, why don't I, why don't I do, a, do a viewer question here? Okay, I, go there, for it. There's an email here from uh, somebody in Springfield, uh, Jess in Springfield, and they were asking about the hydrangea question, which I know constantly seems to be the same question over yes. and over again. <laughs> but it yeah. says they're looking at their uh, uh, dwarf Sykes hydrangea and their dwarf limelight, and uh, just to maybe give you the correct, uh, it's Sykes dwarf and it's uh, uh, little lime is the dwarf version, but. Uh, it says they don't mm -hmm. see very many blooms, and they did trim them back in February. So what we need to do is back up. Those two hydrangeas are completely different hydrangeas. So what I did is I brought a sample, uh, the Sykes mm -hmm. Dwarf. Now this is this is my version of the oak leaf hydrangea <coughs> um, uh, Snow Queen, but uh, uh, oak leaf hydrangea has got this oak shaped mm -hmm. leaf to it. Mm -hmm. It does bloom on old wood, so you do not want to cut them back. So it kind of said they went in and pruned them back and they lumped both their kinds together. Mm -hmm. So this particular one, like the, the blue and the pink and that microfile, you don't want to cut them back because they do, and they don't need a lot of pruning anyway. Now, mm -hmm. remember way back, I know it seems like a long time ago, but we had a rough spring this year in mm -hmm. Illinois. Lots of dieback on roses, lots of dieback on some hydrangeas. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would believe that we had some winter kill on these 
Uh, they look good right now because of, if you're in an area that's gotten a lot of moisture, they put a lot of growth on. But I think that's why you may not be seeing blooms there. Mm -hmm. Now the other one, that limelight or the dwarf version, the little lime, uh, I, I, didn't, I just grabbed a couple other hydrangeas. These are all paniculata types. Mm -hmm. They bloom on new wood. So the pruning of them back shouldn't have affected the blooms. Although I will tell you my big six to seven foot limelights got froze back. And I know it's a combination of the froze and the dry, but uh, so they kind of got knocked around and didn't bloom as heavy as normal. So I'm kind of wondering that the act of pruning, plus we had a rough winter and you're wondering why you had a few blooms. Not, I, I think chuck it up. If the plant looks good, run with it. That little, that, that, that limelight and little lime series, they should kick right in and be fine. I don't think I'd do anything different. And so yes, you can prune those and they would bloom on new wood. So, so don't run out and climb all your hydrangeas. Some you can and some you can't and, and you just kind of learn what you have. Okay, learn as you go. But That's otherwise hydrangeas are very, you know, these are very, very low maintenance, nothing to do with them and, and that, so. We do have a lot of hydrangea questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a universal question. <laughs> yeah, but. yeah, I would also add to that, unless your plant um, is too large for its space, which is your fault because you planted it in the wrong place. Um, <laughs> don't prune them until spring, and then when you wait until they leaf out a little bit, and if you have some tip, die back. <clears throat> On the smooth hydrangeas, like the the, um, the endless summers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Annabelle types with the round head, not the not the cone shaped ones. You can just even uh, those, but especially these other ones, if they don't have any tip die back. Don't cut anything off them. Wait till they start to leaf out. Cut an inch back into the new wood, down to a leaf axle. Don't be living those little sticks up. Um, but if it's, uh, you know, it, unless it's too large for for where it's at or it's got some crazy branch going this way or that way, don't prune them at all. I don't know why you would even want to do that. Just be patient so and give them time. They're they're made to look like a fantastic explosion of color in mid to late summer. So I. Let them do that. I'm, I'm guessing people hear the word dwarf, and dwarf is a, sometimes a misnomer. Yeah. Dwarf yeah. just means smaller than the big. So hydrangeas, mm -hmm. even these newer cultivars, are going to get six plus, maybe even eight feet. So the dwarf's going to come in at four. Yeah. And I think sometimes people buy the dwarf, and they're thinking, oh, it's going to stay 18 mm -hmm. inches because that's what they bought it at. So be careful of that, that, that dwarf doesn't mean 18 inches. Dwarf just means smaller than the big version. People... They hire folks to do the copy on these little labels. Read them, okay? <laughs> Just read them. They do, these people put a lot of effort into being succinct uh, and enthusiastic right. and accurate. You know, do them the favor, read the label. It'll tell you everything you need to know. Okay. And if they don't tell you what you need to know, you just email us. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so give us a call. We'll give yeah, them a there call because I'm still an intern. There so, you go. <laughs> Marty, this is for you. We've got a few minutes left. Joe ah, yes. wants to know if she can freeze freshly grown basil. You absolutely can, but I think the best way to do that is to kind of whiz it up in a blender mm -hmm. and combine it with some <coughs> oil and freeze it in little ice cube trays. And then once they're frozen, you can take those out and put them in a, like a Ziploc bag mm -hmm. in your freeze. Try to squeeze as much air out of that as you can, but you're gonna have a lot better luck with the flavor being fresh that way. Also, dry them, you can dry them also, and you know, cut them, let them hang upside down, they'll dry, mm -hmm. strip the leaves off, you know, you can crush them a little bit or not, as you, as you would. You got anything to add to that, Mr. Butter. Herb? Oh yeah. Butter works. Herb butter. You can't you, go wrong with that's butter. That's right. It, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, and, they, and I, you just, just get your um, butter to room temperature so it's not liquid, and then cut up your basil, put it in there, mix it up, put it, like you said, the ice cube trays, ice cube trays work, work great. wonderfully. Yeah. And, and then you put them in the Ziplocs, and if you need one, you take one. If you need three, you take three. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And, and how just, long um, should they let them dry, if, if they were going to dry till them? Till they're crumbly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Till they're crispy. Till they're crunchy. Till you can go, and they just gotcha. come right off. Do it over, you know, over a piece of wax paper or something. And mm -hmm. Just okay. strip them off, the, hang them upside down. Just bundle them, hang them upside down, strip them off. Okay. You can do that with oregano too. You can let the stalks, you can put a bag around them. I saw this in Italy actually last fall. Um, just tie a loose plastic bag, not tight, just loose, hang them upside down. Go like that inside the bag and then open the bag, reach in, get how much you need. Mm -hmm. Just kind of give it a little squeeze, rub it off a little bit and bang, down it comes. 
And there's such a huge difference in fresh herbs oh, and yeah. seasonings. Mm -hmm. There's no comparison. You know, w yeah. When you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. But mm -hmm. that first time, <laughs> that oh, was deep. Wow. I like that. Yes. <laughs> Very profound, right? <laughs> Very profound. Do you do um, a lot of saving or growing yes. of your own? Oh, yeah. I know he does. <laughs> I have, I, I've got two bags, two brown bags full of summer savory in my office right now, just drying. Uh -huh. And it's so much better than anything you buy in the grocery store. Oh, yeah. I make a liver sausage with it. It's one of my grandfather's uh, old recipes. And it has beef liver and pork and, and then summer savory, a little bit of thyme. I grow my own thyme. Mm -hmm. And then marjoram, which I don't grow because it's an annual. But I, I might try that, too. It, you hardly have any marjoram in it. but. And that's a good place to start too. You can just, you know, have a few pots on a windowsill mm -hmm. yeah. and, and take from there. I grow a lot of cilantro because we mm -hmm. do a lot of tacos at our house. Yeah. So. <laughs> but yeah, sage. It's, it's so much better than than It trying. is, yep, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And sage is, uh, if you're a big fan of sage, and even if you're not, um, it's very uh, decorative mm -hmm. in the herb garden. You can just grow it as a perennial in your garden. It's very pretty, big pink purple stalks of flowers. Pollinators love it. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for coming today. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Good night.